Good morning and welcome and greetings on this beautiful morning in Wisconsin. And yes, it is raining fairly heavily, I think. And yet this is a beautiful morning given the drought that seems to be affecting so much of the nation and of the world. So we're very fortunate indeed and thankful to see the rain today. And certainly we will continue our prayers for those around the world who are suffering so greatly from the lack of water. I was noting to somebody that uh, we went to, out to dinner to the Imperial Garden. This was the first time that we had been back there since the night before the pandemic hit. And so it was kind of an interesting and kind of a weird feeling because that was a Thursday night we went and Friday uh, zap, uh, kind of everything changed. Uh, but we even though in Dane County they've reduced the risk level from high to medium, and yet we still want to encourage uh, if you feel comfortable or if you feel that you might be at risk, uh, please feel free to wear masks that we are going to continue to provide. Um, I know that just this week I've, I've heard of three of our regular members, attendees, mask wearers uh, who have come down with COVID. And so it is still out there and very, very contagious. 
We also are moving very rapidly toward the fall, although we have the month of August here to still enjoy. Uh, but our last Sunday for our summer worship hour, 9 o'clock, will be Labor Day weekend, right? Correct? Yes. And then the following weekend, September 11th, is when we will shift to 1015, but that is the triathlon weekend. And so things get a little wild around here traffic-wise. And so our church year and Sunday school kickoff time was going to be September the 18th. Uh, in the meanwhile, enjoy the summer rest, and people get ready. That's the sermon title today, by the way. People get ready for the new things coming in the fall and in 2023. Friends, are there any special concerns or joys that we would like to share? Yeah, Sarah. The birthday when? Tomorrow. Well, Dick, happy birthday. And you're, you're going to get celebrated in style, right? Yes. Yes. I heard that from him. Sarah, did I hear that from you? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Enjoy and happy birthday. Friends, any other joys or concerns that we look to share? Then let us, as we are able, stand and share together in our call to worship. Reflecting Psalm 50. Come, listen to the one who speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Come, see the one who shines forth in the perfection of beauty. Come, bring thanksgiving, the sacrifice that honors the one who shows the salvation of God. Responsibly, we share our prayer of confession. Surprising God of mercy and love, thank you for calling to us this day. We praise you that you challenge us to show our faith in ministries of peace and justice, offering compassion to all in need. Open our hearts and minds today to hear your words of encouragement and challenge. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Forgiving God, you know how easy it is for us to celebrate with joy 
the wonders of your love. We create wonderful art to represent the joy we feel. Our music soars to the heavens in praise of you. Yet how often we have left our service to you as mere thoughts and intentions without fulfillment. You ask us to be ready to serve you at any time, but we place our commitment on the to-do list of life. We will do these things when we get to them. Forgive our hesitancy and our self-serving ways, O Lord. Heal us of the disease of seeking first our own comfort before we engage in acts of justice and mercy. Open our eyes and ears to the cries of those in need. Help us to give and also to receive ministries of love and reconciliation as we serve you with our whole hearts. Then our music, our art, our worship will truly reflect your awesome and abundant love for us. Let us open our hearts a few moments of silent and personal prayers. Friends, it is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. It is our joy to serve God by helping each other and all those in need. We are assured of God's tender mercy toward us, and we continue that love in all that we do. Amen. And please be seated. And Joan will share with us our... Good morning. First of all, I want to read to you the epistle to the Hebrews is a letter to the early Christian church, especially to the early Jewish converts to Christianity, who are contemplating abandonment of their Christian belief and return to the faith of their ancestors, which was Judaism. The writer gives them confidence to continue in faith, even though the practice of their faith presents them with many difficulties and challenges. Now our reading today is in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, and verses uh, 8 to 16. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out our place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren. Because he considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. <clears throat> All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return, but as it is, they desire a better country that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, John, for that reading. A reading which the apostle is encouraging people to remember their heritage, but to look ahead instead of yearning and looking backward. 
And it goes along with the reading in which Jesus tells the disciples and all to be ready. Friends, before we have that reading, let us exercise the privilege of prayer as God's people. May God's Spirit join us together and conclude with the prayer Jesus taught us. Let us be in prayer. O Lord of peace, of shalom, and of justice, how easy it is for us to fall into a sense of complacency to get used to doing things the way we've always done them before. We do celebrate your love. We rejoice in your gifts through our ministry of worship and of sacrament. We place our abundance before you in offerings to enable ministries of hope to flourish. Yet, O oh God, we know that we hang back, that we hold back. We feel that we've done enough. We may think that we've met the challenge of your call to us. And so we ask you to wake us up and to shake us up, to get us excited about the wondrous ways in which we can serve you. So God, don't let our awareness of the needs of others be expressed only in prayers of healing and compassion, but shape us to be people of justice, to be people of peace, to bring the glorious news of your love to all people. In this time of prayer, in our words of prayer, and in the deep yearnings of prayer that do fill our hearts, whether they're spoken or not, we pray that you would move our thoughts and prayers and intentions to mold the lives that we live. If we would pray for the healing and wholeness and peace of others, then Help us to become instruments of that healing and wholeness and of peace. And let us stand as a witness by the ways that we live out and share actively in the ministry of Jesus every day. Witness to the presence of the holy in the midst of the usual. Today, O oh God, we do lift up in our prayers those who need a special embrace of love and spirit. Especially, we continue our prayers for Doris Waldman that she can experience strengthening and a path to wellness. We pray for all those who are experiencing and sometimes surprised to experience the COVID disruption, a disease that continues to be very contagious. And even if we have our vaccines, oh God, we know that people can still suffer greatly. We pray, O oh God, for those who are in the conditions of war and disruption, particularly the people of Ukraine in a war that seems without end. We pray for peaceful intentions and reduced rhetoric in so many places in the world and especially around Taiwan. Because even in bellicose posturing, God, we know there is such great risk and distress. And we pray, O oh God, for all those who are stressed, feel that they are at the breaking point as economies falter, as hard choices have to be made to make ends meet, and the insensitivity of those who choose expediency or power over loving concern and faithful action. So indeed, O oh God, in our times, wake us up. Stretch us out. Make us truly to be disciples ready to help and welcome others. And create in us a new spirit, a joyful energy to serve you. For we pray and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us as disciples to pray these words as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. And as just mentioned in our gospel reading from the 12th chapter of Luke, Jesus is teaching, he's telling parables, he's trying to stir and prepare his disciples and all those who hear, all those who have ears to hear, to be ready. Listen to the teaching of Jesus. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourself that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door to him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are the servants whom the master finds to be alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. May God bless to us these words and teachings of our Lord Jesus. Friends, there was a point in this sermon preparation for this week at which I was thinking to myself, if anyone, anyone in the congregation this Sunday knows who it is that made this song famous, then I just might say amen and end the sermon right there. Maestro. People get ready, there's a train a coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. Come on, all you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. Don't need no ticket, you just thank the Lord. You know, a lot of blank stares. <laughs> People get ready for that train to Jordan. It's picking up passengers coast to coast. Faith is the key, open the doors and board them. There's hope for all among those loved the most. All right, come on, who made that famous? Who wrote that song? Huh? Close. Curtis Mayfield. I'm still getting a lot of blank stares. <laughs> oh, come on, you know in your hearts it was Curtis Mayfield. <laughs> well, anyway, I said I might end the sermon. You know better. <laughs> but I truly do need to share more because even though we are in these sultry and warm and humid and wet days of August, we do know September's not far off the fall season, in which we're going to be sharing a new church theme. You may have read about it in the newsletter from Isaiah 43, 19, when the Hebrew people were in exile, but they were getting ready to leave exile and come back to the Holy Land. The verse is, watch for the new thing I'm going to do. It is happening already. You can see it now. 
That's God's message. Watch for the new thing I'm going to do. It is happening already. You can see it now. And so in this fall, there's going to be anticipation and excitement and some anxiety and bewilderment about what comes next as our pastor search committee continues its work and it completes its search for the next settled pastor of Salem Church. It's happening now. You can see it. The profile is just about finished to be posted. The strain of tension and anticipation, anxiousness, all those things are quite in keeping with the biblical story, both in the Hebrew scriptures and in the parables of Jesus, in the urgings of the prophets, in the liturgy of the church. Think about it, words that we repeat and we we repeat them so often they just kind of filter on through. Thy kingdom come and until he comes again. Anticipation. Attention that says that God is ready for us. The question is are we ready for God? And it is attention about a journey. It's attention about a place that God wants us to be, although perhaps not a physical location as much as a spiritual state of where we are. And it may be that we need to make a physical journey first in order to embrace a spiritual journey. Because there's a train that's coming. I remember a story of a classic example of of being ready of anticipating but not knowing where the train is going to take you. There was a young man who was a seminary student at the uh, Illiff School of Theology. That's in Denver. And to be honest, he didn't seem cut out for the ministry because he failed just about every course that he took at the seminary. Instead of the normal three years, he had been at it for six years already, and he still was failing. He did, however, have a license to preach from his bishop, and he was serving seven small churches in and around Denver during the time that he was there at seminary. And yet, he was a flop at every single church. And each one of them asked him to move on because he just didn't seem to have the skills or the rapport that was necessary to make it in their church, in their city setting. And so finally, this young man went to his bishop and pleading, he said, Bishop, isn't there some church out there that nobody wants? And the bishop said, yes, and guess who is going there? That's where he sent this fellow, this failure. He sent him way up in the Rocky Mountains to a little coal mining area, tiny tiny village. And you know what? They loved him. He was the only pastor they had ever had who was willing to crawl down into a mine shaft after there had been a cave-in and to read scripture to trapped miners. He was the only pastor they had ever had who would be out on the picket line on a cold morning serving coffee and trying to bring peace and reconciliation to troubled labor relations. Now he had a lot of problems. His wife was very sick. His car would constantly break down. He had to drive back to Denver to seminary often through ice and snow. The parsonage roof caught on fire and as he was trying to fix it he slipped and he broke his leg. So with all the problems that were mounting for this young man, he had to leave that remote church and move back to the city of Denver. But on his last Sunday, the people of that coal mining community packed the church. There were so many people. The mine was closed. All the operations ceased. 
And people were standing inside and outside the church and they opened the windows so as outside could hear the service. And when the last hymn was sung, a huge Polish miner came up to the pulpit with a hat that was filled with money. And he put his arms around the pastor and he handed him the cash. And he said to him, preach, us guys love you, give you this. And he gave the pastor a great big Polish bone-popping hug, crunch. The pastor felt it in more ways than one. He knew he now could make it in small remote churches that no one wanted or would accept. And that he could do it on the strength not of scholarship or of polish, but on the power of just letting Jesus shine through his life. And this young man went on to be a very successful lay pastor. And he had a powerful ministry, effectively serving a very remote area in North Dakota. The thing that touches me the most about this story is that there probably are many, many people who think they cannot do ministry because they don't have the right culture or education or the style, or degrees, or maybe they don't have enough biblical knowledge or techniques or having read books or natural eloquence or whatever, that says to them they simply need to embrace, accept, and share the love of God. That's the skill that they need, to accept and reflect the love of God. That's the definition of ministry. It's not restricted to the clergy. In that sense, friends, you are all ministers of the gospel. In Hebrews, we heard part of the witness of the early Christian church that although every indicator was against Abraham and Sarah, still they heard and they followed the voice of God on a journey And look what followed them after that. And likewise, the Jewish Christians didn't have to follow all the rules that had accumulated of their tradition. They just needed to venture forth on a journey that would establish a new tradition of faith in Jesus. It takes courage to step out on that journey. And it takes a lot of preparation, and it takes a lot of non-preparation. Uh, Tom, okay, we, we, we get the preparation part. Study, prayer, going to church regularly, hanging on every word of the sermon, right? <laughs> Sitting on a committee, fulfilling our commitments to support the work of the church, and so on. Preparation. What is this non-preparation for the journey? Well, just think of a week's vacation. You pack three times the clothing you need. You stuff far too much in the car. You have to clean the house from top to bottom so that you don't return to an unkempt house. You have to take care of the mail delivery, get someone to water the plants, set the thermostats and alarms, make sure all the bills are paid, and that there's Wi-Fi wherever you're going. By the time you get away on your vacation, you need a second vacation to recover from all the preparations. But Jesus is saying, that's not how it happens. The journey comes quickly. We need to be ready in an instant to respond. We say, whoa doesn't sound like our way of doing things, does it? Don't form any committees, no parking lot discussions, no mission statements, no new slogans, instant ministry? What will it look like to those who expect us to have complex planning? 
How can we control such spontaneity? I would invite you to look up on YouTube. There is a absolutely wonderful YouTube video by Benjamin Zander, Z-A-N-D-E-R. Benjamin Zander, who's conductor of the Boston Symphony, who's speaking about, well, surprise, loving classical music. But also he's speaking about how we treasure and relate to those who are around us. At one point, Conductor Xander says that he no longer measures success by accomplishments or fame or wealth or accolades. But rather, the way he puts it, he says he measures success by how many shining eyes he sees around him as a result of something he has said or done. How many shining eyes he sees as a result of something he has said or something he has done. And by shining eyes, he means people get it. Whether it is a sense of the beauty of the music or an experience of empowerment due to his regard for them, or whatever it is we give to another that conveys to them love and care and worth and joy. And he says that when he sees those around him whose eyes are not shining, he has to ask himself, what is it that I am not doing that allows their eyes not to shine? And that's the get ready part of this sermon, friends. Get ready to make eyes shine around you. And if they are shining, then whisper a little prayer of thanks for the privilege. And if you look around and the eyes you see are not shining, whether it's people within or outside our congregation, whisper a little prayer for strength so that you can touch a life with healing and with a word of grace. Churches today fret a lot. Did you know that? They really fret a lot. They fret over the future. They fret over who will come to church, who is going to lead within the church, who will participate, who will pay. And when we fret, our eyes are not shining. And when our eyes are shining, when we are ready, then we no longer need to fret. Because God will provide for us a community of shining eyes, a people who are ready to let God's light shine forth from their eyes to those whose eyes may have grown dull. That is what Christ offers to us. A presence of spirit, a presence of challenge, a presence of calling, a presence of ministry that gets us ready for the journey and lights our eyes to show the way. So friends, that is what you can and should expect. That is what lies ahead and calls you into the future for Salem Church and for your own spiritual life. If you don't see the shining eyes of faith and hope, keep looking until you do see them, particularly in your next pastor. And prior to that, people, get ready. Get ready by making your own eyes shine with joyous expectations that come to desire God and in that desire for God, you will discover that God's desire is to fulfill ministry in you. I want to end with a passage from someone whose eyes always seem to be shining in his writings through his poetry and through his faith. And 
You may be familiar with the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran, but he puts it in very good terms. It is thy desire in us that desireth. It is thy urge in us that would turn our nights, which are thine, into days, which are also thine. We cannot ask thee for aught, for thou knowest our needs before they are born in us. Thou art our need. And in giving us more of thyself, thy givest us all. People get ready, there's a train a coming. Come on. People get ready, there's a train a coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. You don't need no ticket, you just thank the Lord. Amen. Friends, in our thankfulness to God, let us empower God's ministry through us as we make our offerings. As we share in this worship today, Lord God, remind us to serve you in ways that matter. Help us not only to count our blessings, but to bless others with those things you have entrusted to us as gifts and graces. Bring into our minds now and always that our days are consecrated to you through our faith and through the yearnings of our hearts. Take us then where we are and walk with us day by day through the times and the phases of life. In Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, God is a mystery, and often life as well is a mystery. But in faith, life becomes a mystery that is the fabric of who we are and what we hope for ourselves, 
for our world of today and for the generations of tomorrow. So venture now into that mystery that takes real form in the people of God. And be joyful in the living of these days. People, get ready. Amen. <laughs>